Don't some choose the Zoom instead of what you're using? Yeah, um, lots of people use Zoom, lots of people use Camtasia. I think more people use Zoom now, so I may switch over to it at some point. So here we go. After this line, and see if I can block it off so that's on that side and that's on this side. Okay, so we're going to list our variables. We have an X variable and we have a Y variable. It's really the only variables we have. I mean, we could come up with a third one, right? Where Z is equal to zero, and in here, Z is equal to X plus Y. And then down here, we wanted to print out Z. Let's start tracing. Trying to get those centered so I can do this. Okay, so line one sets x to one. Line two sets y to two. X did not change, so I didn't bother modifying its value. Line three, z becomes zero. I'm pretending I'm a computer. Line four, while x is less than five. Is that true? Is x less than five? We can come over here and see the value of x and know whether it's true or not. <clears throat> Somebody say, yeah, Yeah, it's true, definitely. So we're going to go in, we're going to do that line. Y equals Y times X. Well, Y is 2, and 2 times 1 two. leaves it as 2. And then X becomes X plus 1. So X was 1, what does it become? 2. 2, and then Z becomes X plus Y. Four. 2 plus 2 is 4. And then we come back up and we check it again because we're at the end of the loop. Well, x is 2, but 2 is still less than 5. You know what? I'm just going to change this to 4. It's kind of shorten the run cycle a little bit. y is equal to y times x. Okay. Well, y is 2, and 2 times 2 four. is 4. x gets 1 added to it. It becomes 3. And so what is z equal? x plus y is... Have I heard someone say it yet? Seven. Yeah, seven. Yeah, you got it. And then we reiterate our loop. X is now three. Three is still less than four. So Y equals Y times X. Four times three is 12. X, one gets added to it. That's four. Z should be those two things added together, 16. And then we go back up to the top of the loop. While Z is less than four. It's no longer less than 4. So we're done. And we would print out x, y, and z, which should print out 4, 12, and 16. Let's see if we're right. Let's enter this as a program. Let's launch up this. I mean, obviously, the syntax is bad. We'll have to do a little bit more than that, but we can get it going. Empty project, lecture J. I think you named it CPP. I <laughs> did, because I also teach C sharp, and so I prefix those with CS because I'll have two lecture J's, and otherwise they have the same name. So right click, add new item, lecture J. I'm going to go get my boilerplate, paste it. Did you update our boilerplate? Yep. A little bit, but not with the absolute newest thing. We added something else, and I forget what. Oh, for random numbers, I think. It needed time. Dot H included in it. Be worth doing. We'll figure out what we need to do to update it. Oh, yeah, that's totally wrong. Modules, boilerplate and brood. Little bit, yeah, there's two more includes we need to put. C, S, T, D, L, I, B, and time.h. So there we go. 
let me modify my boilerplate and then come back in and upload that after class is over. So we need pound sign include less than E C S T D L I B C S T D L I B and include time.h. Now why do we need this one? We need C S T D L I B for rand for the random number function and s rand. And we need time.h to get the time function. You know what, I don't remember why we had to have both math8.h and cmath. Hmm. I don't like that. Don't you, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, I'm, I'm not digging it. Oh, maybe for math defines to get the value of pi and stuff like that. Yeah, that sounds right, to get the uh, m underscore pi to work. So pound sign include, well, let's, let's put a note here. except I'm going to put that in the boilerplate itself so that I won't have to do it again. So math.h gives us m underscore pi and other defines. cmath gives us the pow function and tangent and sine and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. abs, absolute value, all that good stuff. Square root There we go. I'll need to upload that again. Now let's enter the same code we had. What, x equals 1, y is equal to 2, z is equal to 0. So up at the top of int, int x equals 2. Excuse me, x1, y2, z0. So x is equal to 1, comma, int y equals 2, comma, z equals 0. And then uh, top of our while loop, while parentheses, anybody remember what our limit was? x less than what? Four. Yep, 4. All righty. And then y equals y times x x plus plus, and then z equals x plus y. And then we printed those values out at the very end. C out less than less than quote x equals space end quote less than less than x less than less than e and DL. And I'm just going to copy and paste that two times and change it to y and z. Now I'm going to run it and see if I get the same values that we did when we did our hand tracing. No, because I got an error. Let's take a look. Hoo hoo hoo, a whole bunch of errors. Oh, anybody see the syntax error up here in this line? I did it wrong, so you're going to have to fix it too if you're copying me. What's wrong with that line? You forgot the int for C. Um, sort of, except the real problem is I shouldn't have put that there to begin with. Yeah, yep, there we go, because of the comma. If it had been a semicolon, yeah, I would have needed to do int there, but it wasn't. So there. Take that second int out that was there, delete it. Now we have a lot better chance of it working. All right, 4, 12, 16. Is that what I had in my spreadsheet? 4, 12, 16. Yes, so I hand traced it correctly. But what do people really do out in the, uh, the world nowadays is, is they use the debugger. But sometimes you can't use the debugger. Right. But 
we're going to use a debugger and we're going to set a breakpoint here on while. And I would like for as soon as you all get all the code typed in to follow along and do it on your own machine. How do you set a breakpoint? You click on the gray margin right there. Or it may not be gray if you're using, you know, some black version. But set the breakpoint there. And then lo click Local Windows Debugger. And it's going to run to that point, and then it's going to stop. It didn't do the whole thing. It didn't print out X, Y, and Z. It's because it's hanging right there waiting. Now let's see if we can find. I'm going to click under View and find View. I'm looking for something in particular. See if I can find it. <coughs> Well, I'm disappointed. I can't spot it yet. I'm looking for the debug windows, and I'm not spotting them on here. Am I just blind? Is it under other windows? Okay, fine. Start a debugging session. Choose Windows Locals. Okay, so I'm coming back over here. View, or excuse me, oh, it was over here. Window, Windows. It is not there where it said it was. I'm wasting needless time looking for this. It's in the debugging menu. Where's the debug menu? It's on the, it's next to Oh, the it's right there. All right, cool. So where is it? Where's the Where's the uh, view variables? Windows. You are awesome. Locals. Variable. One doesn't have all that. Did you press the run? Did you click the? Uh, did you set a breakpoint? Let me Let me step through the steps again. I'm going to stop debugging. I'm going to put a red circle in the margin by clicking there, and then I'm going to click the green arrow to start the debugger, and there should be a debug menu here. And under debug, you ought to be able to choose Windows, Locals, and it shows X, Y, and Z, and their values, Z1 and 2. Now I want to go to the next line. Well, it's kind of hidden over here, unfortunately. You've got to find this little menu right here, this little task bar. It has a red square there that means stop, and then it's got a semicircle to the next of it. Somebody running it on the laptop showing me if it's there. Okay. I'm not seeing anything. Okay, you didn't follow my steps about clicking on the margin. Well, uh, there's maybe a syntax error or something. Go back in and add the other includes layer. Yes, sir. Uh, can you go back to the uh, variables? I have not. I'm a little behind. Put your cursor right here on the margin next to while. A little further over. A little further over. A little further over. Yep. Click right there. That sets the break point. Now run it. It runs and it stops it there, and you see your variables. Yep. Okay. So from the little menu, the little toolbar up there. So hard to see. There's these little things over here. One of them says step into. One of them says step over. For now, we're only going to use step over. 
and unfortunately f ten is mapped to something else on my keyboard so i can't just click f ten step over is also in the debug menu somewhere i would have thought yeah step over is here but it's easier if you find the toolbar so if i do step over it goes to the next line the yellow cursor tells me what line i'm on so i'm going to click step over and it jumps to the next line it's now getting ready to do that line the variables haven't changed yet because it hasn't done that line if i click step over again it has done that line and so now the value of y is different no it's not because y was equal to 2 and x is equal to 1 but the next time it would change we're about to do this line x plus plus so x is going to change from 1 to 2 and I can keep clicking a step over and I can click, keep watching the variables change. So if you have a bug in your code and you can't figure out what's going on using a debugger, will help you an awful lot. And it's like I ought to have several weeks of just using a debugger just to get us really skilled in it. And then when you're done, you press the little red square up here that says stop debugging. Or you can choose it from the debug menu, stop debugging. All right, I'm going to wander around and make sure each of y'all got that working because I consider it that important. Quarter. If you right-click on a toolbar, we ought to be able to choose debug. And it'll either hide it or show it. Does that bring it out? Yeah, it's in a different place. Yeah, so you can drag it around now. Yeah. 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 I just wrote, look at this, actually I an iOS book in a while. Yeah. Yeah. I made a red dot right. there, and now we can start our debugging. Well, he was already there at the one point. Let's stop it and restart it. And then we can start clicking step over and watch our variables change. Yeah, it's going to be Eventually we'll get to the pause statement and we're all done, so we can just stop debugger. Debug, stop debugging. Alright. Sure. Alright, that's called a boilerplate. And so you shouldn't have to type it in every single time. What you want to do to save yourself time is go to modules. Go to I can't stress enough how important the debugger is. If you start programming professionally, you're probably going to spend half your time inside the debugger. What is the PDB file? Yeah, the PDB is the, uh, are the files that support the debugger. But the PDB files, yeah, when you compile it for debugging mode, it makes a, what's known as a PDB file, which has a whole bunch of information about it that Microsoft uses to, trick, to help the debugger. But if you're going to give your file to somebody else to run, you don't want to give them all that extra information. They could use it to reverse engineer your program or learn too much about it. That's what you do here is you change debug to release. And now when you run it, now if we do build, rebuild solution, it removes all the debug information from the uh, executable and the PDB file is no longer there. And then if you want to run it, you're no longer going to run it in the debugger. You're just going to click debug start without debugging, and it'll run it. But we don't mind the debug information being there, so I'm going to switch release back to debug. Switching it to release makes your program more efficient because the debug code slows it down. 
makes the, code, the executable smaller, so there are reasons to do that. We just like keeping the debug mode on so that we can do stuff with it. So it's now lunchrj.exe. Yeah. All right, and so this is just showing us a demonstration of hand tracing. Great. A case study, and yeah, we'll, are we going to skip this or are we going to look at it? I think you gave us homework on that many times already. General crates builds custom designed wooden crates. You've been asked to write a program that calculates the volume, the cost, the customer price, and the profit of any crate you build. And so to do that, you might need these variables. We're going to skip the case study. We know how to write programs already. We're pretty awesome. And a hierarchy chart. Well, if you took fundamentals, you know what a hierarchy chart is. If you didn't take fundamentals, well, I don't care. We're skipping that too. You can look at it from here. And that gets us to the end of the chapter by skipping that. All right. It's worth reading. I'm not trying to give a short shrift, but it's we've done programs already that ask for information and do calculations right it's, it's not new to us that you can do that so let's move on to the next PowerPoint oh wait you post our PowerPoints on Canvas yeah they're in the modules if you go to modules you'll see PowerPoints it says PowerPoint unit one but then there's about 70 PowerPoints in there and obviously we're not going to do all of these unit one ends at chapter four so at the end of chapter four is when our first exam is going to be exam yeah we got to have exams occasionally just to prove how smart we are I think that would be our midterm right correct it's going to be a bit after the actual midterm I like to let people who are taking an eight-week course get everything done with before you come in here so that our final and your eight-week final aren't the same week. And I think you are teaching an eight-week course, if I'm not mistaken. You're correct, I am. Not a programming course, but yep, good memory. You know too much about me. Relational operators. We've already been using relational operators. We know how to use less than and equal equal. But there's something I need to point out about them. So you have equal equal, you have not equal, you have less than, you have greater than, you have less than or equal to, and you have greater than or equal. Now in elementary school or whenever you learned about less than and greater than, you probably use that to mean not equal. but. We use that. But we need to talk about the opposites of each other. Um, I think in mathematics they use an equal sign and they just slash it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the opposite of equal equal is not equal. The opposite of less than is greater than. No, it's not. The opposite of less than is greater than equal. And the opposite of greater than is less than or equal. And that may not seem like it makes sense. But it is true. I'll show you what I mean. Go to your code. And above that hello. I guess we don't need that hello anymore, huh? Do this. Int x equals 3. And then let's put an if statement. If, parentheses, x is less than 10 in parentheses. C out, less than, less than, small, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Now we're going to do the opposite. If we didn't know better, we might write if x is greater than 10. So if x greater than 10, parentheses, C out, less than, less than, quote, big end quote, wait, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. And let's run it. We know what it's going to print, right? What's it going to print? Somebody can tell me just by looking at it. It's going to print small. Yeah. I need to remove my breakpoint. 
We're done with the break point, so you're going to have to click on the red circle to make it go away, or else every single time you press the green arrow, it's going to stop there. Ooh, I have an error. What do you know about that? That's probably because I'd already declared X. So, you see the word, yeah, see the word INT there in my statement? That's my error because we already had declared X. So, if you're getting the same error, if it's not working, delete that. All right. It, in fact, 3 is small because it's less than 10. I'm going to change it and make it 20, and it's going to print big. Surprise. Not a surprise. What happens if we set it equal to 3? What's it going to print? Excuse me. What happens if we set it equal to 10? What is it going to print? Don't just run it. Just look at the logic and tell me. Is 10 less than 10? I heard a no. That's correct. 10 is not less than 10. Is 10 greater than 10? Nope. So it's not going to print anything. So these are not actually opposites of each other. That is the opposite of x less than 10 is greater than or equal to. Now it handles all cases, including when x is equal to 10. Yeah. So just remember, the opposite of less than is greater than and equal. And the opposite of greater than is less than or equal. It's going to write small. Yeah. doesn't write anything on mine if I enter 10. Exactly, and the reason why is because you have, and you typed it in exactly like I did, you have less than 10 or greater than 10. But if it's exactly equal to 10, it's not going to print small or big, so we need to make one of them like greater than or equal to 10, and suddenly it's going to start working. All right, so the result of a comparison can be stored in another variable. Like if we do this, bool space result equals x less than 10, semicolon. Or how about we make it bool small equals x less than 10. And let's make another one. Bool space big equals x greater than or equal to 10, greater than equal 10. And then we can print those values out. C out less than less than. Is it small question mark? Or how about just the word small question mark? Small question mark space end quote less than less than small less than less than e and e L. Bless you. And do the same thing for big. C out less than quote, big question mark, space, end quote, less than, less than, big, less than, less than, E and DL. And I'm going to change this back to something that I flat out know is going to be small. So I'm going to change it back to a 3, x equals 3. All right, it is small, and so small question mark, one. One means true. Big question mark, zero. Zero means false. So we're seeing that it is, in fact, small. We could put some if statements here to prove the point. If, parentheses, small, in parentheses, C out, less than, less than, quote, yes, comma, small, exclamation mark, backslash n, end quote, semicolon. And do the same thing for big. So just copy and paste that, or however you like to speed things up.
So now when I run it, it's going to print small, small question mark one, because it is small and one means true. And then it prints yes, small, and it doesn't print anything about yes, big. The reason why it doesn't print anything about yes, big is big is not true, right? So it's not going to print yes, big. This and this look similar, right, except the results of this comparison are stored in this variable, small, and the results of this comparison are stored in this variable, big, because we did these two things. That's called setting a flag. Small is a flag indicating that the value is small. Big is a flag indicating that the value is big. I'm going to add a comment to that effect. A Boolean variable, variable, just a bool, contains the result of a logical expression like x less than 10. This is called a flag. <laughs> I put in. You can then use the flag just like you could use the expression. Now, why would you want to do that? Does it make the code any easier to read to put if small than if x is less than 10? No. But the calculation to determine whether something is small might take a lot more statements than just a single if, right? There might be a lot of calculations involved. Maybe we have to calculate the density of it and the volume of it and do all sorts of stuff before we come up with our final answer. And then we could store that final answer in a variable, and then our if statements are still simple, even though all the calculations to come up with it are large. A lot of, you know, a lot of calculations. So what other kind of flags might you set, right? I'm just going to put some examples here. So don't if, have to write it down. Well, you don't have to unless you want to. Um, Error equals items greater than a thousand, right? We have too many items, right? Frozen, can I type? Frozen equals temperature less than 32. Boiling equals temperature greater than 212 for the English units. You know, the metric units are different and stuff like that. We can have state uh, Fahrenheit or... Yeah, we could have put like temperature F to mean Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, empty equals number of items equals equals zero. Or, you know, volume is equal to zero. Wait, volume equals equals zero. So if the volume is equal to zero, then it's empty. If the temperature is greater than 212, it's boiling. If the temperature is less than 32, it's frozen. If our items is greater than 1,000, we have an error. That kind of thing. And then later on, you can use that stuff, right? If error, if parentheses error, then do something. If empty, do something. So we have these flags that control a statement further down in the code. You might have some code that looks like this. While, parentheses, not empty, right? And it'll keep running until the empty flag gets set to true. So the if statement. We know how this works. I'm not going to spend a long time on it. If it is raining, take an umbrella. If it is cold, wear a coat. Flowcharts. Is it cold? Wear a coat. Otherwise, don't do anything. This is called a single alternative if, to use the uh, terminology from Donna Wilson's fundamentals class and mine, but I didn't have any of y'all in my fundamentals class. This is a single alternative if because there's no else, right? It's just something or nothing. All of our ifs in here are single alternative ifs. Now, I spaced them out kind of funny, right? I didn't do what we normally did, which is this. You know, I didn't do if 
parentheses big, in parentheses, next line, and then do something, right? I just did it all, all, all on one line. But since there's no else, it's a single alternative. That is a single alternative if, because there's only one thing that happens. It's not if else, no else. It's, it's something or nothing, right? It either does something or it doesn't do anything at all. That's a single alternative else, if. Here's a dual alternative if. If parentheses small, in parentheses, then do something else, curly brace, do something else. That is a dual alternative if. Dual alternative if. And we got an else if. Because you, yeah, and that's when you even have more than two alternatives. You're right, because you have else. So it either does one thing or another. And then definitely you have else if, if you need to chain a whole bunch of different possibilities together. Oh boy. So like <laughs> if parentheses, what was our number called, x? If x equals equals or less than 0, C out, listen, listen, quote, below zero, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Else, if x is less than 32, C out above zero, but freezing, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Else, if x is less than 212, c out less than less than the water is liquid, backslash in, end quote. And then one final else just to handle boiling. A final else, c out less than less than quote, the water is boiling. Or do not touch. Yeah, do not touch. Well, even if it was 200 degrees, I wouldn't want to touch it. But yep, definitely if it's boiling, bad sign. Versus somebody would say, shut the thing off. Now I'm going to read. Does else mean colder too? Pardon me. I didn't understand. I'm sorry. I was thinking. Okay. If this is also known as an if cascade, and I'm going to reformat it, but then I'm going to undo it, so don't make the same changes I'm making. There, right? That's legitimate spacing, but I wouldn't do it that way. You know, you could add all the curly braces you wanted to. This is called a cascade. Why is it called a cascade? Because one definition of a cascade. is waterfalls that look like this. Lots of little waterfalls. Just like our indentions, right? So a series of if, else, ifs can be called a cascade of ifs. Now I'm going to undo all that because that spacing is silly, right? There we go. Uncool this way, right? I like it like this. This is cleaner looking. There's nothing wrong with tabbing it out. Don't make this change. Tabbing it out like this, right? That works. We could get it to work, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to make it look silly. Uh, why is it all red? Because I've made a mistake. I've undid, undid some stuff I should not have undone. All right. So like this. We could have worded it like this, and it would look stupid. And 
this is valid. It's a valid way to write the logic. But it looks stupid. Exactly, right? So anyways, I'm, I'm certainly going to undo that. There's absolutely no reason to do it that way. But that's what it means, right? Else. So if in Python you did not have an elif, this is how you'd have to write it. But you do have elif in Python. Or put else if. Else if is a syntax error in Python, unfortunately. That's hard. Actually, in fundamentals of programming logic, you have to learn Java and C++ and Python at the same time. Yeah, I just focus on Python, actually. I figure people learn better if they stick to one language while learning it. Miss Wilson may teach it a different way. Uh, actually, that, that kid had Mr. Weber. Oh, OK. So if you have an if statement, there can be more than one statement in the block. Right now, there's only one statement in the block, right? Or actually, this one doesn't have anything. But this is one statement. If you have more than one statement, you have to put <coughs> braces. It's not like Python, where you can just tab it over. You know, it is really, really cold. Backslash in. Now that I've got that there, and I'm going to leave this into the code, but it caused an error. The reason why is if you have more than one line of code in a block, unlike Python, the indention doesn't help. You've got to use a curly braces. There, like that. So after the if, you can have a single line of code or a block of code enclosed in braces. I am um, whatever notes you feel like taking if you think you've got the concept you know I'm not requiring you to type in everything letter by letter <laughs> so if expression statement and this expression has to be a logical true false statement or if it's a number it treats zero as false and one as true and that's in C and C++ not in Java but that was a housekeeping one If it's below zero, bad data, that's housekeeping. I think we might cover that, right? Not so much. We had to learn that in fundamentals, so I'm blowing it off. <laughs> so if statement notes, you do not place a semicolon after the expression or it breaks. If I put a semicolon here. It's going to break. Yep, we're going to have errors all over the place. And the reason why is if you do an if with a semicolon after it, if whatever, if x is equal to 3, and then you have, uh, I'm going to wind up deleting this code most likely, or at least commenting it out. If you put a semicolon there, it's the same as doing this. If x equals 3, how about you do nothing? We never want that. So never put a semicolon after an if. <laughs> the real rule is never put a semicolon above a curly brace. So it doesn't matter if it's a while, an if, a for. Just never put a semicolon on the line above the curly brace, right? No matter what this line is. Just put a bunch of random gibberish and put a semicolon there. It, says, hey, it won't compile. All righty. Now, this is very, very vague, and they don't go into any detail on it. No, oh, it's up to me to explain it. Be careful testing floats and doubles for equality. I think I've demonstrated floating point errors before. But let's do it again. Double D is equal to 1.0 divided by 3. And then D plus equals... 1.0 divided by 3, and make it 7. 1.0 divided by 7, and then plus equals 1.0 divided by 7. And then just copy and paste that until we've added 
it together seven times. So that's two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. We want seven of those statements. Thompson. Yes, sir. I have to head out or leave. Let me make a Dropbox for you, okay? And then you can watch the rest of the video at home. All right. I've prepared for once. How about that? All righty. So now we have D. If you add 1 over 7 seven times, what should it equal? Just like if you add 1 over 3 three times, what does that equal? Yeah, it should equal 1. So if D equals equals 1, oops, I forgot my uh, curly braces. If D equals equals 1, didn't curly brace, then C out less than less than, yes, it's 1, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Else, I'm going to take the braces out to get more stuff on the screen at the same time. Else, C out less than less than, no, it's not 1, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. And I'm going to run it, see if it's equal to 1 or not. No, it's not 1. What? A, okay, we start to go crazy. We know that it's supposed to equal 1, so let's print it out. C out less than less than D less than less than E and DL. It says it's 1, but then the next line says it's not 1. I think it needs to have it equal to. Nope, the problem is, is it's just a little bit larger than one. Very, very, very small. But if you print out C out less than less than D minus one, less than less than E and DL, we're going to find out that there's a very small rounding error. Floating point math that you use with doubles or floats is not precise. You can get rounding errors. Look at that. Look how small that number is. But that's the difference between that number and the real value 1. That's a point followed by 15 zeros and a 2. Very small difference. So how do you check to see if a number is about equal to another one? You take the difference between them and you use the absolute value function. So if we've included cmath or math.h, we ought to have an ABS function, an absolute value function. What is an acceptable difference? Let's, let's assign an acceptable difference. And I'm going to call that, I forget the, uh, the official name for it, so I'm just going to call it acceptable. Double acceptable is equal to 0 0.00000, right? If it's that close, if those numbers are that close together, I'm going to say they're the same. And so next, we're going to do this. Double space delta, which is the difference, or maybe I should just call it diff. I'm going to get too mathy. Diff is equal to ABS subscript D minus 1, because 1 is the expected value of it, in parentheses, in semicolon. And if diff is less than acceptable, I'm not liking the, uh, the term acceptable there. Allowable difference would be better. But anyways, if diff is less than the minimum amount of error, then it's good. So C out less than less than, but it's really close to 1 backslash in, end quote, semicolon. So to compare floating point numbers, since floating point numbers get rounding errors, why do they get rounding errors? Because, uh, well, just like uh, 1 over 3 is not 0.3, and it's not 0.333, and it's not 0.3, you know, with 23s after it, it's an infinite number. 1 over 3 is an infinite number that cannot be displayed in base 10. Well, these numbers are stored in powers of 2, base 2. 
And there's a whole bunch of numbers that cannot be stored precisely in base two. One over three, one over five, one over seven, one over nine, any of those odd numbers cannot be stored in base two. They try, it goes out to a certain precision, but just like that is not actually equal to one over three, then those numbers are just approximations. And when you start doing math with them, it gets close. But there's always a little bit of a rounding error. So that's how we compare. How to compare floating point values. Define a minimum acceptable error. Take the absolute value of your variable and its expected value. Why is that D? And then check to see, and I'm going to put in parentheses, the diff or delta. And then check to see if that diff is less than the minimum acceptable error. The only reason that's D is because I scrolled up. We're not supposed to be looking at that anymore. Here we go. That's how you compare floating point values. You define a minimum expect acceptable error. You take the absolute value of your variable minus its expected value, or the difference, right? Take the absolute value of your variable minus its expected value. Should be putting periods in here to be, you know, speak good English, and then check to see if that error is less than. This will be the last thing we do today, and we're not going to actually have any homework over it because we've all been using if statements already. Yes, sir. Um, I keep getting a syntax error right here, and I typed exactly what you typed. Well, where did I come up with the? Oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't type, though. I guess you thought that I was faking it, that it was that stuff that I don't care about. But actually, you have to have this stuff for it to work. Crap. Yeah, yeah, that'll do it.